Thank you for uh, joining us this morning, this afternoon, to talk a little bit about the impacts of current events on the college softball recruiting process. Um, one note up front, we are recording this session and we will make it available on YouTube and on our blog. So if you have anything that comes up and you have to you know, exit this webinar, you will have the chance to listen to it again. We'll be sending it out by email. Um, so certainly not your only chance to, to get a hold of this. Um, you see there what we're going to discuss today, college recruiting during coronavirus, and the two aspects of this that we're going to spend a lot of time uh, chatting about today are the impacts of some of the NCAA rulings that have come down recently, and also, and, and most importantly, what current high school student athletes can be doing right now to continue to advance their recruiting process, even while we're in an NCAA dead period and seasons are suspended. Um, you know, what can we be doing right now to set us up for success once things open up later on the summer, in the fall, whenever that may be? Uh, before we dive into the content, I want to talk about who you'll be hearing from today. So, Matt, could you please uh, give yourself a quick introduction? Absolutely. Thanks, Max. So, hey, everybody, um, see a lot of familiar names on here. My name is Matt Sternberg. I am the Director of Business Development for the Honorable Camps. Um, I know I've chatted with a lot of you on here, but I've uh, been at Head First for almost six years, and uh, it's been an amazing experience being able to work with student athletes, their families, uh, being able to kind of help navigate and guide them through the process, um, putting them into camp as well as spending countless hours just working with a lot of you and with a lot of others. Um, I grew up in Boston, came down to D.C. quite a while ago and joined the Head First team. And um, it's been, like I said, really exciting to, to see what we're able to do and continue to do over the last 20 plus years. Awesome, Matt. Thank you for uh, for joining us. And up front, I will say, both Matt and I have dogs. We are working from home. So if you hear hear a bark, hear some some footsteps, uh, Jenny and Finn apologize. They appreciate your, your patience and understanding. If they uh, if they barge in on the webinar, we'll try certainly try to minimize that though as well. Um, my name is Max McKenna. I'm our senior manager of marketing for our showcase division at at Head First. Um, I attended Amherst College where I played uh, baseball. Played there for four years. Graduated in 2011. Then went into teaching and coaching um, at the high school level at first and in a couple private schools up in Massachusetts and then New York where I was coaching baseball, coaching football, soccer, um, and also uh, teaching history at the ninth and 10th grade level as well. Have worked a lot of summers coaching travel teams and kind of recruiting advising for travel teams at the 16 and 18 U level. Um, interned for two different summers while I was in college, forehead first, came back full time just about six years ago, actually, and have since then really been working very hands-on with this division and um, bringing my experience as a coach and as a student athlete um, at, you know, in the in the Division three that high academic space, um, to bear for, for our families. Kevin. Hey, everyone. My name is Kevin Keen. I graduated from NYU in 2017. Um, prior to that, I actually attended Honor Roll Camp in 2012. Uh, I was originally recruited to play baseball at Dickinson before transferring to NYU. Uh, like Max, I had the opportunity to intern twice for Head First, and I came back full time a little over a year and a half ago as the Associate of Marketing, working very closely with Max and Matt. Thank you. Um, and and Kevin is going to be a big part of what he's going to do. He is off screen because he'll be handling a, a lot of the questions that come in, um, which leads us into the the agenda for the evening. You see there at the end, the live Q&A. We're going to answer as many questions as we can possibly get to and stick around as long as we need to to make sure that you all have your answers. Um, you can ask those questions directly in the GoToWebinar toolbar. If you find that questions tab, if something comes up over the course of the webinar, type it in there, fire away. Kevin will be collecting those, and then we will do that Q&A towards the end. We might sprinkle a couple questions throughout um, throughout the presentation if they uh, are relevant to what we're talking about, but the bulk of that Q&A is going to be there at the end. First, we're going to focus on the impacts of the coronavirus, the season suspension, some of these uh, recent NCAA decisions. We're going to focus on how they have impacted um, the recruiting space, specifically at some of the high academic schools that we partner with, Division One and Division Three level. Um, then we're going to spend a lot of time talking about what student athletes can be doing right now to continue to advance their process as well on the softball field, in the classroom, standardized testing, the recruiting process, um, coach communication, kind of all those aspects of it. Um, 
then we're going to briefly touch on just a few additional resources that I would like to put you guys in touch with to follow along. Certainly, we love being a resource, but there are also a lot of great uh, folks and resources out there uh, in this in this day and age to, to put you guys in touch with. And then, as I mentioned, we'll transition directly into the live Q&A, uh, where we'll spend a lot of time just answering questions that come in from the, the viewing audience, the, the live attendees right now. So first up, the impacts on recruiting. So um, a few weeks ago, we did a webinar for travel coaches that um, focused on some of these same things, but it was before some of the NCAA Division I Council uh, decisions had come down, specifically about this first bullet. So with the suspension of the 2020 softball season and, and all spring sports, the NCAA has decided to grant an, an extension of one year of eligibility to all spring student athletes who are participating in this year's um, spring sports. So this means seniors who are set to graduate can come back for a fifth year and, and still have NCAA eligibility for their sport. If you're uh, if you were a freshman in college this summer, or it's rather this spring, and this was your first year, you essentially come back next year as a freshman again. You are still a freshman in terms of your eligibility at the schools that you attend. This does and will have some ramifications on the recruiting space, which we will certainly certainly touch on, but that is kind of the, the foundational decision that the NCAA made right on at the end of March, beginning of April, um, they decided to extend that one year of eligibility given the season suspension. Um, 12 scholarships, as you guys m might know or probably know, um, there are 12 scholarships at a fully funded softball program now, and you are limited to that number. However, with this extension of one year, uh, this one year eligibility extension, seniors scholarships that are coming back to attend for a fifth year, those scholarships will not count towards the 12 total. So you'll essentially, a, a college program will have, um, 12 scholarships among their incoming class of high schoolers 2020 through their this year's junior class those seniors whether or not you know if, if they come back the senior scholarship so the, the college class of 2020 scholarships will not count towards that 12 scholarship limit one impact of this is on potentially and depending on the program which we'll certainly touch on some of the nuance of is the impact on roster size at some of these schools um, in, in softball, it's a bit different than some other sports, specifically I'm thinking baseball, which does have a hard roster cap of 35. Softball doesn't have a hard cap on the number of student athletes that you can have on a roster. Um, but if you look at rosters, you typically see a roster size in the 15 to 20 player range. There is the potential that seniors returning for an extra year of eligibility or current juniors returning for the 2022 season over the next four years with this one year of eligibility extension you could see rosters that are a bit bigger than usual and so this could potentially have impacts on incoming recruiting class sizes um, the playing time for for incoming recruits the scholarship availability to some degree um, so kind of thinking through all the second order effects of uh, what this eligibility extension will mean for scholarship availability, roster size, playing time, all those those sorts of things. Um, one important note here is that Division One, Two, II, and Three all extended this eligibility. It is a bit unique and different at the Division Three um, level, just because you know there aren't scholarships. There's no scholarship maximum because there are no scholarships. So it's certainly related, you might still see some of these larger rosters at the division two and three level. Um, but without the scholarship dollars at the division three level, it is just a little bit different in terms of the, the ramifications and the impact there. Hey, Max, jumping in here, I, you yep. know, I think I'd, I'd love for you to touch on is, and I know we'll get to it a little bit later, but it fits in really nice here. And I've seen, you know, we, we've had previous questions come up, um, at least to our team is the, you know, laying out that different schools, the types of schools they are, it's going to mean different things for them. So larger power five schools versus Ivy League schools versus, you know, your higher academic schools, et cetera. Like, what does that all mean for, based upon their graduate programs, what they allow, as well as, you know, our nuance of is a senior um, really going to stay another year if they have a job offer, et cetera, et cetera. So why don't you touch on that and I can jump back into it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and this is kind of a, the, the crux of it, right? It's going to vary program by program. It's going to vary 
player by player in terms of the decision that they make about continuing their softball career at the college level with an extra year or moving on to whatever is next for them. So a couple kind of unique things to think about. One is the Ivy League, which when we say high academic softball, those are certainly some of the programs that that easily come to mind. The the Ivy League is unique in that it is a division one league and they're they're all division one schools, but they do not have athletic scholarships. So that is, you know, that 12 scholarship cap and the availability of those, that doesn't apply to the Ivy League. Also, the Ivy League is unique in that it, it has an internal rule within its its members that there you cannot have a graduate student on the roster for their sports. So, and they have decided that this rule still holds. So even though a senior at Harvard has an extra year of eligibility, the Ivy League has said, great, you have to take that fifth year if you're going to do a graduate school and take a fifth year of eligibility. You have to do that somewhere outside of the Ivy League. They are still not allowing graduate transfers or graduate students in their sports despite this one year eligibility extension. So in in this case, we talk about roster size and scholarship impacts. The Ivy League essentially will not be affected by this um, because those seniors have to transition elsewhere. Even if they're going to take advantage of this fifth year of eligibility, they are going to do it elsewhere. They're going to have to find a different program to, to transfer into. Another unique kind of setting is a school like Amherst, where I went. No graduate programs, no scholarship. So for a softball player at Amherst to take advantage of the one-year eligibility extension, this fifth year of softball at Amherst, they would have to, you know, pick up another major and take a full class load to, to remain eligible, and they would have to pay another year of tuition. Um, so, at the Division three or non scholarship players at the Division one level, the balance that they could be kind of finding themselves in is okay. What is the value of this fifth year of softball? What is the value to, to my family, given that if I'm not in a full scholarship, what am I having to pay to continue my study? If I'm going into a graduate program, it might be different than if I'm, you know, sticking around because I have some courses to, uh, to complete for my, for my last major. So the balance of paying the tuition, am I on scholarship, am I paying part of my tuition is going to impact a lot of people's, a lot of players' decision whether or not to come back. The other thing is, as Matt you know, thoughtfully touched on is what is going to be the impetus for somebody who, you know, a, a softball player who has a job offer waiting for them. They are headed to Teach for America. They are headed to their law school. They are headed to their job uh, in, in the financial world, working at Morgan Stanley. Like, is that job offer waiting? Are they going to put their post-college plans on hold to take advantage of this extra year of eligibility? And again, this is a player by player decision that they're kind of working through um, that certainly will impact and, and will, quite honestly, I think, incentivize a lot of a lot of girls to not come back for their fifth year, depending on what they have waiting for them after their playing career and their college career is over. Matt, anything to add there? Yeah. Yeah, so I also think it's going to come down to individual schools on what they decide, as well as coaching preferences. We've seen this happen with some Power 5 schools that have said, quite frankly, we're not going to allow our seniors to come back. We're moving on. You're also going to have coaches that maybe they allow this, and then they realize, well, I'd rather have that stud incoming freshman or whatever it may be with years to come because, and I know you've touched upon this with your old coach, for example, um, that you'd rather have somebody that you've recruited that you now have three more years or four more years than necessarily a senior. There's a trust factor, sure, but I do think that it's going to come down to an individual basis. And it's a fluid situation that we just don't know because coaches haven't been in this either. So it is something to watch and, and see. We wish we had more answers, but I think it's going to come down to individual schools. It's going to come down to individual coaches. And it's also going to come down to what does the player want? What is best for that player? And what is best for that family? Absolutely. And, and to, to expand on, on that a little bit, Matt, the, the key thing about programs making this decision is the NCAA said they gave a blanket waiver for all spring sports student athletes. And they said, you can access this, but they also gave a lot of autonomy and prerogative to the, the programs themselves and said, you know, if you're Ole Miss softball or whatever, you can bring back your seniors. They have the eligibility. The scholarships won't count towards your total, your total maximum, but as a program, you have the decision. If you have a girl who's on a 100% scholarship or a 50% scholarship, you can bring them back at the same level of scholarship that they were on this year, 
or below. So it might be that in terms of, as Matt said, if a coach is kind of trying to, we used to say in teaching is, is you know, counsel a, counsel a student athlete out of the program, they might say, look, you can come back for your fifth year. You might have a roster spot. You might be competing for a roster spot, but I don't have the same scholarship dollars that I had for you. Um, one interesting thing that athletic departments around the country are starting to, to deal with and kind of wrap their heads around is what is the financial impact of going over 12 scholarships going to mean for, for their programs? You know, if you consider it's softball, lacrosse, it's baseball, it's all these spring sports, what is the total financial impact of carrying extra scholarships in the athletic department and, and what that means for their budget? So there's certainly department-wide, there's NCAA-wide conversations, they granted an extension. Um, and, and they're giving this, this scholarship waiver. There's department-wide conversations within a school, and then there's also team-specific conversations about what they want to do. And what, what Matt touched on is my, my college coach always said, if a senior and a freshman coming into the season are equal, and I think that they can both contribute to the same level to the program, I will always play the freshman because I know that I have four years with this player to get them better so that when they are a senior, they can be making more of an impact if they get to play right now, whereas that senior is going to be out of my program next year. So that's kind of what Matt was touching on and, and the preference of different coaches is going to play a, a really big role in terms of these individual decisions and conversations uh, with their student athletes too. And then what are the recruiting impacts of these decisions? And we, and we kind of touched on, on some of these in terms of the roster size and the scholarship availability. So the, the first group of, of players that I want to touch on are committed student athletes. And these really would be in the 2020 and 2021 class, given the fact that um, the, the ruling, that the softball ruling uh, from a few years ago now was that you cannot have recruiting specific conversations until after September 1st of your junior year. So 2020s and 2021s are the only high school classes that have past that threshold and so should be having these recruiting specific conversations where they are you know talking dollars and cents and scholarship money and roster spots with college coaches there's also a difference between them class of 2020 has gone through the signing period and so if you're a 2020 commit i think i think actually yesterday was another opening up of the of the later signing period but if you're a 2020 commit you have a signed nli national letter of intent saying here is where I'm going. And that is a binding document in both directions. The NCAA says players cannot break this. Schools cannot break this. This is a this is a binding written contract. If you sign an NLI, you are going to that school. And there is a commitment in both directions. So in, in my view, this is a big part of the reason that the NCAA extended the scholarship waiver for the 2021 season. Right now, they've granted a one-year waiver where next year's repeat seniors, their scholarship money doesn't count against that 12, uh, that 12 scholarship maximum because they understand, the NCAA understands that college coaches are legally committed and bound to their incoming class of whatever, five or six girls, and they have an extra four or five, six girls who are sticking around. And so they've, to, to kind of free up the scholarship money for both of these groups that they have an obligation to, they've, they've extended this waiver. The difference with the class of 2021 is that they have not yet reached the early signing period and they do not have a national letter of intent. The national letter of intent is the only thing that the NCAA views as this binding commitment and the NCAA does not recognize or govern verbal commitments. So if this is only a one year waiver to the scholarship uh, maximum, the 2021 class, these verbally committed student athletes could be the ones who are who are impacted um, by some of this this roster crunch. If rosters get bigger, but because uh, more girls are, are sticking around and staying on the team to use that extra year of eligibility, and they're on scholarship, and they don't have a waiver going into the 2022 season, which the NCAA has not yet indicated if there will be a waiver for the 2022 year or if it will just be a one year waiver to the scholarship maximum. You could see kind of where some of the where the rubber meets the road in terms of where these 12 scholarships need to be divided now, possibly among a larger roster and could impact the dollars of scholarship that are available. The other potential impact, and I imagine that this is kind of more relevant for the bulk of the, the student athletes and families on this webinar, are the impacts on the uncommitted classes of 2021, 2022, 2023. And the two main things that you see here are 
what is the roster situation that I'm walking into at some of these schools? Is the roster bigger? Does this mean an increased competition for those roster spots? Does it mean a decrease in playing time for younger players? Kind of what is this? What is the situation that I'm walking into given the fact that four years of student athletes could be sticking around for an extra year? The other thing is at the division one level, does this change the scholarship availability just as it might for the, uh, the verbally committed 2021 student athletes? Does this change the picture for uncommitted 2021s in terms of how much scholarship or how many scholarship dollars a, a given program has to offer them or also carrying through the 2022 and 2023 class, um, depending on how much coaches are trying to spread out these 12 scholarships because they can give partial scholarships. Um, it might mean that for 2022s, instead of having a lot of 50% uh, scholarships, coaches are having to you know, break them up more. And they're saying, all right, I'm going to give a 30% scholarship to a handful more girls in the roster, as opposed to a 50% scholarship and kind of break it out that way. So the availability of scholarship dollars could be more, more in a crunch as could roster size, which means competition uh, for, for playing time and for those roster spots. Now, the key takeaways from all these and the, the, what we would point to as the things to think about due to these recruiting impacts, you see here at the bottom of the screen. These two things that you see here, focusing on holistic school fit and arriving on campus ready to compete for a spot on that team, these are not new. The, it's just a, a matter of the degree to which these are, are focused on by the coaches and by student athletes. It is always, in my opinion, the most important when coming out of the recruiting process to find a school that is the right holistic fit for you, the right academic fit, the right social fit, athletic fit being a piece of the puzzle, but focusing on more than just the softball. I think that now more than ever, this is uh, there's really a magnifying glass on this because as 2020 has proved the softball season is not always guaranteed. And whether it's an injury when you're in college or not having the opportunity at the right school coming out of high school or a global pandemic in this case, college softball careers are not guaranteed and softball careers do always come to an end. So what I always advocate with student athletes is to focus on the holistic school fit because ultimately that is what's going to be important in setting you up for success and for a productive post softball career, whether that is after high school or after college or after you redshirt and you spent a fifth year in college or after 15 years playing for Team USA, doesn't matter. Eventually the softball cleats come off and to me, finding the right school holistic fit is what sets you up for the next step after that. And so focusing on this is really, really important once you take into account that softball careers can end at any moment for a host of different reasons, some that you might have thought of, and some like coronavirus that probably had not occurred to a lot of student athletes before all of a sudden their senior year was suspended and they're set to move on to their next step. The other thing here is arriving on campus ready to compete for a spot. Again, as an incoming freshman or recruited student athlete on the softball team, this is absolutely already the expectation. College coaches want you showing up on campus in August or September ready to compete for a spot. You are proving to the coach and to the program, to your teammates, what can I do to help this team? Um, and that doesn't change. It's, it's not like that is a new thing that you are being asked to do. It just changes maybe the amount of competition. Instead of competing with 15 or 18 girls for this roster spot, maybe now there's 20 or 22. So it's not a categorically new thing, but it does maybe change the degree of the competition or turn the temperature up on how many people you are competing with uh, for that spot on the roster. And Max, so what we've done is we've done a lot of these webinars, you know, over the last call it 12 months, last year, last 12, 16 months, not a lot has changed from what we're saying now with obviously a few caveats. And I think what's important is student athletes have heard this, parents have heard this, but it's always, you know, it has, it's, it's always been, well, at the end of the day, you know, it, it works, you know, the softball's there, the school's there. I think now more than ever is an opportunity for parents to be able to really express to a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old kid who may not be fully, you know, understanding of all these things uh, is that now more than ever, it's really important to make sure, can I see myself at this school for four years with or without softball? When I get to campus, knowing my expectations now, they really need to be in line because 
there is going to be folks that have played four years already of college softball and that were starters and studs on that team. And they're going to go in and their expectation may to be to play 50%, 70%, 100% of the time. And that may be different. So what can I do now, which we will get to prepare yourself. What can I do now to make sure that I'm taking those right steps to make sure a the school is the right fit for me B that I'm doing everything in my power to compete at the highest level. Absolutely. That's a, I mean, really zeroing in on these things. Um, what can I do right now to compete to, to when I show up on campus and also focusing on this holistic fit? So, so important in the way that we counsel student athletes through this process. Um, before we move on to what's next, which is what student athletes can do, Kevin, are there uh, any questions that, uh, that you think we should tackle right now before we move on? No, so I think there's one good one to bring up right now. Um, I know we, we touched on it, but I think it's good to go over again. Um, if schools have the, the full 12 scholarships at their disposal still, why might there be a scholarship crunch? Great question. So the scholarship crunch could come about if not for the 2020 class, but for the 2021s, 22s, if a current college 2022, so you know, a, a rising junior in, in the um, Florida State let's say the Florida State program, they also can stick around not just for their junior and senior year, but also for the year after that, because they also have that eligibility. So it's not for next season that there might be a scholarship crunch. It's for the year after that, when there isn't a waiver allowing uh, teams to go over that 12 scholarship maximum. But now they might have a few girls who are sticking around for a fifth year, and they have an incoming um, recruiting class. And so they're taking the same scholarship pool, but maybe divvying up instead of 12 to 60, or rather um, 12 scholarships among, let's call it 17, 18 girls on the roster um, who are freshmen through senior. They're now taking the same 12 scholarships and dividing them up between freshmen through that that fifth year senior. And so there might be a few extra girls who would be eligible for that scholarship might be on uh, on that scholarship as well. Great. Uh, some more good questions coming in, but I think we're going to touch on some of those topics later. So uh, we can hold off for now. Fantastic. Um, so next, what can student athletes be doing right now? What can families do right now to really set the table for themselves to continue to move the recruiting process forward at their target schools? We're going to talk about four areas of focus, physical development, you know, getting stronger, faster, all that stuff in-game and softball development, how are you focusing on your game right now, sport specific, um, academics and standardized test prep, and then the recruiting process. You know, obviously the, the recruiting process does kind of take into account those three bullets above it as well. But when we talk about recruiting process, we specifically mean how am I communicating with college coaches right now um, to get on their recruiting radars and set the table for a really busy summer recruiting landscape. As we work through these these four areas of focus. I also want us to keep in mind these four keywords, um, motivation, discipline, proactivity, and asking for help. These are things that are always important, but I think that given the shifting paradigm for softball, for academics, for recruiting, for the world writ large, having the motivation, discipline, proactivity, and ability to ask for help structured more internally for a student athlete is really, really, really important. Um, you know, in, in a lot of cases, if you're in a typical school year, typical softball season, some of these things are delivered to you from the people around you, right? Your coach and teammates are giving you the motivation. You have the structure of a routine to enforce the discipline of going to your team's morning lift or staying late at practice to get some extra reps. Um, the proactivity is delivered to some degree because coaches and instructors and teammates and parents and teachers are more kind of directing some of your work. Um, what's different now is that you don't necessarily have the same access to those support structures. So this motivation needs to be more driven from internal. The discipline and creating your own routine to set yourself up for success needs to be driven from within in a way which previously it didn't um, necessarily have to. And then all of this takes the proactivity and the ability to ask for help and recruit the resources around you. So as we work through these four areas of focus, I want you guys to keep in mind these four keywords and we'll kind of tie back to them explicitly as well. But keep in mind, how am I working through my motivation to focus on my physical development? How am I working on my proactivity in the recruiting process? All these things. Um, 
Matt, anything to add there before we move into the, the areas of focus? No, I think these are, there's a lot that's out there right now that is tough to actually stay focused. We're, you know, we see a lot on social media, you're hearing stuff here, there, and, and, and everywhere. So how can you really take what's important um, and I think it doesn't necessarily have to be these four key words, although we think they're pretty important because they can really ladder up to each. But for you, for you, whether it's your travel team or whether it's your, your own student athlete or you as a student athlete, have some of these as mantras for yourself to put up on the board there. So that way you are trying to stay within that rhythm of staying focused, staying motivated, really being able to go out there and, and be proactive. This is going to help kind of out, you know, create an outline for yourself in order to be successful during this really tough time that honestly, not a lot of us really have a lot of understanding. on. Yeah. So first up, physical development, getting faster, stronger, all these things. The first most important priority, can't overstate this, is stay healthy. Um, in order to keep moving forward with your workouts, you're going to need to stay healthy. So do everything that you can to focus on that first and foremost. That's the, the first bullet um, so that you can have a successful foundation for continuing to make strides in your development in other places. Um, the other thing here is continue workouts from home. Um, one, one quote that I like to pull on, is this is from the Vanderbilt baseball coach, Tim Corbin, who's one of the best college baseball coaches in, in, in the world. And he, he was asked in this interview, what are your student athletes focused on? And what he said is, you know, they can do a lot of primitive things. There's a lot of things you can do with your body if you move it outside and if you got some creativity. Now, Vanderbilt is the defending baseball national championship at the NCAA Division I level. If they can continue to make strides with all of the resources that they would typically have at their disposal, the weight room, the trainers, the physiotherapy, all of it, then so can high school student athletes. And if they are focusing on things that are about getting creative, using your body weight, keeping it simple, using the restrictions and the structures that you have already, that's going to be uh, a really good way to set up a high school student athlete for success as well. And then this third bullet, you'll see this a handful of times out here as well. Keep it simple and get creative. Um, you don't probably have access to the same resources that you typically would. Not everybody has a full gym set up in their garage or their backyard. But if you work with the restrictions that you do have and you work within the restraints um, that, that, that you currently have, whatever those are, you can still make a whole lot of strides. If you don't ha have access to the full, uh, you know, lifting platform to do deadlifts or the squat rack to get after it with a, with a you know, a, a personal record max back squat, great. Find a dumbbell and do goblet squats to keep your legs strong. If you don't have a dumbbell to do goblet squats, find a hill and run up it as fast as you can 25 times. There's a lot of things that you can do and, and still work within these restraints um, to be able to make strides in your physical development, get faster, get stronger, so that whenever we come out of this, you're in a better physical condition than you were going into this. And Max, to that point on the physical side is – the motivation should honestly not change. If anything, it should really drive you more because you're home. The sophomore in California is home. The, you know, freshman in Pennsylvania is home. So everybody right now, and we'll talk about that as on a level playing, you know, level playing around. Some may have, you know, home gyms. That's nice. Others don't. But like you said, getting creative and using this as your motivation to say, what is that kid doing? Because I need to be doing more than what they're doing. And that really ladders up to a lot of other things that we'll talk about. But that's really where we, as adults, need to be able to help push our student athletes to put them in the position that we understand that you're not going to be able to do all the things that you normally do, but stay focused and really be motivated. So when the time does come, when the bell rings, you're as ready as possible to be. And I know we'll touch on that in a little bit as well. Absolutely. Um, sports specifically, what can I be doing to advance not just my physical conditioning, but my softball game as well? And this is another thing where it can feel really easy to say, well, I don't have access to the hitting tunnel. I don't have access to the full team practice or the full field because I don't you know, have a full softball field in my, in my backyard. Um, there are still a lot of simple creative things that you can do um, to continue to make 
uh, make strides in your softball game as well. And a couple of key bullets to think about when you are when you are doing that. One is gamifying your reps whenever and however you can. And by this, I mean two things. I mean inserting some kind of gamification so that the reps stay fun and you stay fully invested because mindless reps of just, you know, zoning out and hitting the ball off the tee 200 times don't deliver the same value to you as if you are fully invested, focusing on your mechanics and really uh, creating a feedback loop for yourself. So making it somewhat fun so that you stay invested is really key. Also, that touches on the motivation point that Matt just made, which is if it's more fun, you're more likely to, to be able to, to maintain that discipline and maintain that motivation um, to, to stick with it. The other side of this that I mean is when, whether it's June or July or August or whatever, when you get back out on a softball field and face that first live pitch, it's going to be tough because you will not have faced live pitching since your last game this spring, which might have been in February in some places, might have been in March in some places. The other thing that I mean by gamify here is make your reps, make your drills and skill work as difficult and as game-like as possible. Don't, you know, just do front toss where you're pummeling the back of the net. Work in some spins or try to work in some off-speed and delay pitches so that you get some kind of game-like feel to your swings so that when you face that first live pitching, it's not, oh my God, this is really it coming at me at at 58 miles an hour is very different than hitting it off of a tee, right? So how do you uh, make your your reps and your drills as game-like as possible so that you are ready for when this does open back up? Which brings us to the next point. Uh, stay ready to get ready, get ready to stay ready. I understand that this is maybe a nonsense phrase. It's something that I, my, my freshman year of college, I pitched out of the bullpen for Amherst. And this was something that a mentor of mine who now coaches baseball at, at the high school level always said to me. It was stay ready to get ready, get ready to stay ready. And what this means to me is that do everything that you can right now so that when things do open back up, you hit the ground running. How do you not just keep yourself and maintain your skill level, but how do you continue to increase it so that when you are back in game-like situations, you can really accelerate your learning curve and take off and set the stage for future development. So stay ready right now so that you can get ready and, and make some serious strides in your game once things do open back up and get ready now so that you are ready for that. Max, before you, before you get into the, the, the rest, which I actually think is really, really key, with those two points though, understand that, like I said before, everybody's on that level playing field. You're going to have kids that are freaking out they're not like they understand that wow i really need to see live pitching they really need to be able to get out to the field as, as everybody can it's our job again to be able to say hey everybody is in the same boat so now it really is using these techniques to do the best that we can because when we do get on the field it's not going to look as pretty as we want it to and that's okay i think that's really where we need to say to these kids everybody's going to be the same. It's just a matter of how prepared you're going to be. Absolutely. And, and that's a really good point. We've talked with a, a handful of college coaches about this and they fully, fully understand that the first time that they are watching a softball game this summer, whether it's at a tournament or at a showcase like ours, they understand that nobody will have faced live pitching for the most part for a handful of months at least. So they know that girls are going to be rusty and they kind of have that that mindset. The, the question is, what can you do right now? So if you look, you know, terrible and rusty in that first at bat of the game, are you doing the work now? So then in the second at bat, you can really speed up your learning curve so that you are successful the second at bat, the third at bat, the fourth at bat. Um, everybody's going to be rusty. It's a matter of what can you do now to shake off that rust as quickly as possible once you're back in game situations. And, keep, and Max, keeping your mechanics as well, being able to do what you can, control the controllables or trying to work on things, as we said, again, getting creative with that, which we'll, we'll touch upon. So I think those are the things that we have to look at to say, I, I know I can do this and I can do a lot of reps at these particular drills, do those. And then being able to, you know, rely on people like Head First and others to get you new stuff to mix in there. Absolutely. Um the other important piece of this is building in rest periods to stay healthy and to avoid burnout as well. Um, typically when we see girls over the summer, 
softball is a, a, a year round sport for a lot of players in a lot of different parts of the country, which is awesome. And the level of play nationwide and the high school travel so, uh, college level have gone up because of this. But it also means that you're doing some of the same activities and same physical motions year round, whether that's throwing or pitching or hitting, whatever it is. And so it can lead to young bodies, especially being out of balance. What we think about it head first is the obstacles open opportunities the op the obstacle is the way right so right now it's devastating that you're not able to be playing your travel ball season or playing your high school season or you know kicking it off in june at zoom into june whatever it is that's that's been delayed or that you don't have access to it's devastating but it also does create the opportunity for young players to build in rest periods right now and they typically wouldn't have them so that they can stay healthy for longer over the summer and really be peaking um, and at their absolute best when college coaches are watching them over the summer as well. So the idea that this does create the ability for student athletes to rest, stay healthy, get healthy if you have some nagging injuries, um, it's it's kind of the the silver lining of this rain cloud, if you will. The other important part, and we'll we'll touch on this, and, and you'll keep seeing this: keep it simple and get creative. Just because you don't have a full you know dirt infield to be able to to work on or a full turf field to run sprints on, doesn't mean you can't do things. Um, whether it's a tarp in your um, in your garage or a net in your backyard or a miniaturized hitting tunnel or a wall that you're throwing off of to work your backhand technique. Be creative and work within um, your constraints and, and the, the restrictions that you have in your area and with your equipment and whatever you have access to. One thing that I advise, and mom and dad, sorry if this is, uh, if this is not allowed in your house, so you can try not to break any windows, but go to the outside of the house, throw a softball off the foundation and just work on your backhand technique if you're an infielder. Or if you're an outfielder, throw the ball up in the air and work on your outfield footwork so that when we come out of this and you first see that fly ball in the, the bright blue sky for the first time since March, your footwork is perfect. As Matt said, control the controllables, work on what you can and get creative within the, the restraints that you do have. One thing that, this is one of my, my favorite pictures, and it's one that our partners over at Blast Motion sent to us. They sell sensors that you attach to the bottom of a bat, and it gives you some immediate and data-driven feedback on your swing. Things like your attack angle, your launch angle, um, your, your rotational force, all these things that can be really helpful to improve your swing. This picture was taken in a two-bedroom apartment in Brooklyn, um, which... I don't know how many of you have lived in New York as I have, but some of those two-bedroom apartments are incredibly small. But guess what? This softball player was able to set up a tee, tie, the, tie a wiffle ball to a weight so that it doesn't you know, knock off the wall and go, go bouncing around the room, I t put uh, the blast sensor on her bat, and was still able to take full speed swings off of a tee and get some of that feedback from the blast sensor. You know, you don't have to have this blast sensor to be able to do some of these things. You also can set up a tee in whatever space you have to get some full speed swings and do what you can. And this is about, again, keeping it simple, but also getting creative within your constraints and thinking about what can I do with what I have? And that's what I should be doing. Um, one piece of this is I don't want girls to think that they have to reinvent the wheel on this, right? It's, as Matt mentioned, there's a lot of resources out there on social media, on the internet, your travel coaches, your high school coaches, the your hitting instructor, your pitching instructor. You have resources around you um, to be able to call on and say, here are the restraints I'm working with. Here's the equipment I have. Here's the space that I have. What do you recommend? What 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 can I be doing right now to continue to get better? Um, and this comes down to that fourth keyword, which is asking for help. Um, they aren't there with you every day as they would be during a typical season, but that doesn't mean that you can't ask them for help. It just means that it requires one extra step of giving them a call or sending them a text and saying, hey, what can I be doing today? Um, talk to the coaches around you about what you can be doing, what you can be working on right now. And Max, to, to that, there's a lot of great stuff that are online that's either, I mean, we're all probably doing that. If you'd like to continue to work out, you've changed that to virtual workouts where there's people leading classes on Instagram and on other platforms. What I will say is this is where with the ask for help, being able to ask your travel coach and if maybe they don't have all the answers for you, you take the lead. You'd be able to say, well, you know what? I wanna work and I'm the leader of this team and I wanna take you know, the kids from my 16U team and you know, maybe twice a week we do an online 
um, you know, some sort of class. There's opportunities there. There's opportunities on an individual level. But this is where asking, going online, asking there, looking on message boards, looking on really quality sites, but may, may, more importantly, asking your travel program to put stuff together is a reasonable ask at this point. That's why you pay a lot of money to join that team. Absolutely. And we'll touch on what some of those additional resources can be um, toward, towards the end there as well to, to make sure that you have a, a list of some of what those are. The other thing that student athletes, or one of the other things rather that student athletes can be doing right now is focusing on academics and focusing on standardized test prep. So it's really important right now, distance learning, Zoom classrooms, whatever you are doing within in your classroom, in your school, it is absolutely crucial that you keep your foot on the gas in the classroom. It can be really, really easy to say, well, if I'm not physically showing up at school, it's a lot easier to start to blow some stuff off or just give kind of a half effort. But it's also absolutely crucial that you don't do that. Some high schools have transitioned to pass fail for the semester, which is fine. Some are still giving grades. If your school is still giving grades, guess what? Those grades are still going to be on your transcript that you submit as part of your application. So it's important to keep those uh, as a good reflection of you as a student. Even if it's pass fail, that math class that you're going to have next fall is going to build on the principles and the foundations and the fundamentals that you built this spring. So to set yourself up for future success, even if you aren't getting grades right now, it's important that you still give your maximum effort in the classroom and really, really stay focused um, so that you can set yourself up for next semester, the semesters down the road, where again, it will come back to, to some kind of normal where this will be a piece of the transcript that you submit as part of your application process. So not losing sight of that is uh, something that I've talked to a lot of student athletes about and I, I believe is really, really uh, important to do right now. The other thing is um, at, during a typical softball season, you have a lot of time that is dedicated to the bus trips, the, the travel team trips, the practices every day, all this stuff where you have hours of your day that previously have been dedicated to all these softball specific things that now aren't empty. You have other things to fill your time, but you do get some of them back if you're able to create a routine and discipline yourself. What I would advise is start using some of those hours that you get back in your day for standardized test prep. There are changes in the standardized in the kind of standardized testing world. More schools are going test optional because um, April, May, and now June. SAT and ACT dates have all been canceled. The College Board came out yesterday and said they're thinking about a digital SAT. It's like there are changes in the space, but investing some of your time and resources into prepping for these will not be a wasted effort. Um, even if you're applying to a test optional or a test flexible school, having a good SAT or ACT score can still help you. It certainly won't, certainly won't hurt. Um, so still taking the time to build out a plan for your standardized testing and a way to prepare for that is really, really key. And I would argue even at test optional or test flexible schools, it can be a really important thing for student athletes specifically, because for softball coaches, every transcript coming from a different school with a different difficulty of course load means a slightly different thing. A 3.9 from this school might mean something different than a 91 out of 100 from this school versus a 4.8 out of 5 from this school. And it all depends on what the courses you're taking uh, are, what the uh, profile of your high school is, what the courses that are offered. Admissions departments are great at evaluating that holistic transcript, but to give a coach a really clear immediate sense of where you fall academically, standardized tests, for better or for worse, can be a really quick and dirty measure of here is roughly a one clean, standardized, uh, across the board number that can indicate to coaches where you might fall academically in their recruiting class. It's not a statement on how good a person you are. It's not a statement on your character as a human being, but because it is a standardized test and everybody is out of 1600 or everyone is out of 36 and they all mean the same thing, it gives coaches really quick insight into where I think the student athlete might fall. To be able to be successful in doing either of these things, keeping your foot on the gas in the classroom, using and reinvesting some of this time in standardized test prep, it's really, really important that as a student athlete, you build a routine. 
as a student athlete, I know I was, I still am to some degree, a very routine driven human being, right? You have the alarm, you go to school, you have the, the morning lift, you have the after school practice or game, you come back, you get your homework done, there's family dinner, whatever the case is, you have that routine that is built for you by the structures um, of your school, your team, your family, whatever they are. Right now, you don't have those same structures coming from without but it is still just as important to reclaim some of these hours in the day by building a routine, not just saying, I, ah, my first class is at 10, so I'm going to roll out of bed at 9.58, flip on Zoom in the living room and, and go to it. How do you still stick to some kind of routine so that you're able to do all the things that we've talked about? Are you able to reinvest your time in standardized test prep? Are you able to build in your own practice hours in the evening or at some point during the day or the workouts that you that you want to get to? How do you build a routine so that you can still fit in all these different things uh, that you can do right now to continue advancing in your softball game and in the recruiting process? So Max, to, to that point, a couple of things there is I think habits are going to be a really big thing. Obviously, building that routine, but the specific habits right now can be really dangerous because you can pick up a lot of bad habits that will continue over. So what you want to do is really limit that for making sure that, all right, it's not going to look the same, but how can we make it look as similar as possible? By building that routine in there, I know I'm trying to do that with my own life right now, and it's tough. I know you are. We talk about it often, um, and we as a company are trying to do, you know, look at the same thing. Um, this is not easy for us, it's not going to be easy for a teenager, but how can we, um, you know, really put these kids in a good situation? And then regarding the test prep, I think what's important is, again, there's more time to be able to do this, which is great. I think there's also time to be able to say, hey, maybe I normally take the SAT, but maybe I can look into the ACT because I test a little bit better with that structure. So being able to, again, try some new things. We have some resources that we'll talk about on the next page or two pages from now that we can recommend, but there's other things that are out there to be able to use for test prep, to be able to do a lot of practice tests. That is still going to be really, really important because it will pick back up even in a digital age or if they get rid of it or whatever they decide. Again, as Max said, this is a nice way for a coach very cleanly to be able to say, I like this, you know, this kid as a player. I really like them academically because it meets this criteria. So being able to still stay focused, keeping those really good habits, and then using that time, um, you know, to be able to look at things you know other, otherwise wouldn't be able to do, all really good points here. And just to double back on kind of the SAT versus ACT thing as well, one thing, I was on a, a webinar last last Monday, so a week and a half ago, specifically about changes in standardized testing and admissions. And one thing that they touched on that was a really good point, I thought, was given cancellations and when our testing center is open, opening back up, and is the SAT being going to be offered digitally, ACT, is that going to be offered digitally, will it not? Previously, I think a lot of student, a lot of students and student athletes thought, okay, my thinking or my prep works for the SAT, so I'm going to only take the SAT. But in this new age, we don't necessarily know as students which test I'm going to have access to. It might be that I need to get some kind of standardized testing in by X date, and the only things in my area that have opened back up or are available digitally all pertain to just the ACT or just the SAT. So being able to be a little bit flexible in your test prep, where previously you might not have needed to, uh, was kind of a, a really interesting point that they brought up that I would mention here as well. And it was from a resource that we'll certainly touch on called Compass Test Prep, and we'll direct you to their, um, their page later on. In the recruiting process specifically, there are four uh, areas that we are thinking about. Now, we cheated a little bit because each of these four, even though this recruiting process bullet is a, is a sub bullet, we're also going to give some sub bullets to each of these. But the areas that we're going to talk about and we have student athletes focusing on are building your school list and doing school research, communicating directly with college coaches, making sure you have some kind of online profile equipped with video, um, and also thinking about scheduling your summer of exposure um, in kind of this new this new age where you might need more flexibility. You need to think through pieces of it a bit more critically and intentionally. First up, school research and list building. So right now, I, I think that one 
disadvantage, quite frankly, that spring sport athletes are at is that the summer is a really heavy recruiting period for all sports. But if you're heavily in your sport and, and you're in season during the spring, it can be really tough to do the research and lay the, the communication foundation with coaches, uh, with softball coaches leading into the summer because you're busy all spring playing your sport, getting better. Your time is dedicated to that plus school. And then you transition directly into the recruiting season. Um, this second bullet here, use some of this time, again, reinvest it in doing some of the research and communication with college coaches to set the table for your summer recruiting season whenever it is that that starts up. When you do this research and when you start to build out your list of schools, I emphatically, emphatically think that it is really important to focus on school qualities, focus on how big a school is, where it is, how far away from home it is, if it's in a city versus in the suburbs versus in the middle of the country, what's their area of particular academic strength. Um, all these things are really, really important. And the specific school qualities ultimately uh, really impact your experience at school much more than the labels. Uh, what size a school is matters more than if it's an SEC, ACC, Ivy League, NESCAC, Patriot League, whatever it is, the school qualities are going to matter more than if it's a Division I, Division II, Division III, NAIA, junior college, whatever. One thing that I use to kind of uh, illustrate this point and not to pick on the Ivy League, there are some wonderful, wonderful experiences for students and for student athletes at the Ivy League. But if a softball player comes up to me at camp and says, Coach McKenna, I'm interested in Ivy League schools. What that says to me is that they are saying, I am equally interested in a school of three to 4,000 in rural New Hampshire, and a school of six or 7,000 with graduate programs in the heart of Manhattan. And guess what? Columbia and Dartmouth are both Ivy League schools, but they offer drastically different college experiences because of the qualities that they have. They're different sizes. One is in the middle of a city. One is Hanover is not even that big a town, to be perfectly honest. Very different geographies, um, different academic focuses and strengths, different softball programs. So focus in on the qualities and then use those qualities that you think will set you up for a good college experience and match that back against schools that fit those qualities. So rather than saying, I want to go to an Ivy League school and then have to necessarily be interested in um, Cornell School of you know, 15, 20,000 half public in, the, in rural New York and a school in the heart of Cambridge, Massachusetts in the middle of the city, think about what is the size school that I want to go to. Let's say I want to go to roughly three to 5,000. I like it being about 15 or 20 minutes outside of a city um, or, or closer. Um, I'm looking at X for my academic program and I like the Northeast. Great. If you then have those considerations, you can say, okay, I want to be looking at Tufts and Harvard and BU or at the bigger size or something like that. So once you have these qualities, you can then find schools that match those qualities. And the beautiful thing about this is that if you think qualities first, and then you also keep and maintain an open mind as you do your research, it lets you find not only the schools that you have heard of and, and think of immediately when you think of schools that fit these qualities, but then also you get to find lookalike schools. If you've said that you're interested in a school, you know, a small liberal arts, a few hours outside of a city, Yes, you're going to be interested in a lot of the NESCAC schools, but guess what? There's also Grinnell in Iowa that fits some of those same qualities that maybe you had never heard of, but then when you come to camp and you meet the coach and you get to tour the campus, you're just, you're thrilled about what it offers. So keeping an open mind and looking for these lookalike schools is another really, really key way um, that I think you can use to expand your list of schools at first and then narrow it down uh, as you work towards finding that right holistic fit. And Max, I think a couple of things here that point that point out to me, especially when you know we speak to a lot of families, and they say, "Well, you know, my kid's a D1 player." Okay, that's that's interesting. Or, what are some of the schools you're interested in? And they are all over the map. Some of the best softball programs that you see on ESPN, to maybe the, you're not at that level, which is okay. And I think this is the time to really do that research to maybe have a heart to heart with yourself or your child to say. All right, let's look at the rosters of some of these teams and see kind of the history of where they are and where we currently are. I think those are important to be able to do and to ask your coach. I think that's another important thing. Talk to your coach. They should be able to give you honest feedback to be able to say, you know what? It may not be 
UF or Michigan or Stanford or, you know, what, an SEC school, but you're a really solid player and you have these qualities about you. And we've talked about the fact that you want your schools to look like this. Now you can start to actually put reasonable schools into that bucket with some of these points that you've listed out here. So again, to kind of recap, being able to use this time that otherwise wasn't available to get creative with how you're going to do your school research and your softball reach research and how that compares to where your daughter is or where you as a student athlete are. Absolutely. I think that's a really key point is level setting on holistic fit and also considering the athletic fit as, as a piece of that holistic fit. Um, next up, specifically to recruiting process, coach communication. Um, right now, coaches who typically would be in season have more time than they ever thought they would in front of a computer, in their inbox, looking at kids, at, at players' videos, whatever the case may be. They're not able to have face-to-face -face recruiting. They are not running the practices and away uh, weekend trips that they were running with their teams. They are focused on communication in the recruiting process right now. So it's a really good time to get in their inbox, to talk to them so that you can have some direct communication and lay the foundation for the things that come later. It's really important when you're doing this to, to think about a couple of things. Step one, you have to please, please personalize the communication that you are putting in their inbox, personalize it to the coach, to the program, and to the school, which dovetails on the last piece of doing your research, right? If you're going to reach out to Coach Lacey Wood at Harvard, being able to say, Coach, I'm really interested in X major, and I went and looked at Harvard Square, and I just love the, the feel of, of that, you know, that Mass Ave intersection because it reminds me of home or whatever it is, say, citing specific things about why a school is the right fit for you, is a really, really important piece. And, and it makes so much more of an impact on that coach reading it as opposed to, dear coach, I'm interested in Harvard because it's a good school. That's correct. That is absolutely true. But that's also what 40 to 45,000 other students who are applying to Harvard think. And so why is this a uniquely good fit for me? And why am I uniquely good fit for Harvard and for your softball program? So do your research and then use this research to personalize the note however you can. Um, and a piece of this is have the school mascot or nickname, have the right coach's name, which believe it or not happens more often than I care to mention when I talk with coaches and they say, I got 75 emails and 50 of them just said, dear coach and didn't have my name. 20 of them said, dear coach, insert the wrong name or the wrong school. And five of them had the, had the right, the right name, school, nickname, whatever it is. Um, which brings us into the second bullet point, which is you have to proofread these as well. And while a small typo in an email won't get you crossed off the list, um, it's important to make a good impression with these communications, which means looking, does the email address match the coach's name that I'm in the salutation, match the research that I've done in the school, match the name of the school? Does it kind of check all these boxes? Did my personalization work? Am I sending the right note to the right coach with the right details? And also, have I proofread it for clarity? Um, have I made it as short as it can be so that you know coaches get a lot of emails? Have I made it as short as it can be to communicate exactly what I want and what I'm asking them for, um, but not have it be you know a 2,000 word essay necessarily? And mom and dad, this is where you guys can help a lot with this or other adult resources in your life can really help. It is crucial that these emails come directly from student athletes. Student athletes should be driving their own recruiting process, and that is fundamental. Coaches want to hear from student athletes because that is who is going to spend four years in their program. But high schoolers, <laughs> college kids, kids after college, um, proofreading is still really important. And getting a second set of eyes on this is a really, really good idea because some of these communications can be so important and can, you know, there are so many different things that can trip you up. So mom and dad, coach, advisor, whatever it is, proofread these to make sure that everything fits. The thing to keep in mind here is that college coaches spend a lot of time communicating with high school student athletes. And they're going to know the difference between the email that it was written by a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old high school student and a practicing lawyer or somebody who's a doctor. Um, so when it comes to proofreading, limit yourself to proofreading and not 
you know, rewriting or writing for your student athlete because coaches will be able to tell the difference. Um, third point here is be proactive. This is always true. Um, there's no one kind of secret pill to, to success in the recruiting process, but if there was one keyword that I would say most often leads to success, it's proactivity. And so this is always the case. You always need to be proactive in your communication and gaining exposure to college coaches, but it's especially important right now because you aren't getting the same organic um, flow of, of conversations. You're not able to, you know, you're not sitting down with your travel coach and talking about things every day because you don't have that. You're not at a tournament and a coach just kind of, a, a college coach is there watching. Those things aren't happening. So it's important that you have to create some of your own opportunities through things like coach communication and then summer planning, which we'll, um, we'll touch on next. Matt, anything to add on coach communication? I think what you want to do is you want to try to be able to mix it up. So different channels uh, to be able to reach out to coaches on, um, you know, they get a lot of emails and it's tough because, you know, there's not a whole lot that you are able to do, but there's social media. There's a op great opportunity to interact with them there. There's a great opportunity to pick up the phone and even leave them a voicemail. Um, that's different. That's not something a lot of people do. And it's also not easy for a 16 year old to pick up the phone and have a great message. I still work on mine and I'm in sales and my team, we still work on theirs. I'm sure we've called a lot of you and they're not, they don't sound the best, but that, that is important to be able to work with your, your student athlete on now. Um, you, you have a great one always that she says, a handwritten letter. Nobody gets letters anymore. Where are you going to send it? Even if they're not at their office, they still are probably getting some mail forwarded or they will receive it when they get back. And I don't think these coaches are gonna come back like a, a celebrity with thousands and thousands of, of you know, pieces of mail that could really make you stand out. So there's a few different ways to do it. I also think having a reason to reach out is important. We talk about that often. Uh, and then being able to use your profiles, and we'll talk about that as well, to be able to send it out. So being able to update them with some videos, some other things, those are really important pieces um, to be able to make sure that you're getting the coaches where it's not just the same, you know, if I'm writing to you, hey, Coach McKenna, this is Matt Sternberg again. I'm really interested in your school. That's that. I mean, that, that's, that doesn't really help. So it's really being able to craft a reason and be able to communicate with them and get creative with it. Absolutely. And to the handwritten letter point, to the personalization of this point, a key part of this coach communication is demonstrating interest in this program. Coaches want to recruit student athletes that are genuinely interested in their program. That is why personalizing the email or taking time to put pen to paper, put a stamp on it, put it in the mail, um, that demonstrates interest and investment in this that just sending the form email or just copying and pasting the same template to 25 different schools doesn't doesn't do. Um, so taking the time to do that research, to put the pen to paper, to put that in the mail, to send that email that has more than just, dear coach, I like your school, thank you, whatever, um, demonstrates that interest, which is a really, really key piece. I think that the the kiss of death on some recruiting processes is the opposite of demonstrating interest and being proactive. It's assuming that a coach knows that I'm interested. Of course, Coach Wood knows that I'm interested in Harvard. 45,000 other people in the country are interested in Harvard. I'm not unique in doing that. But guess what? She doesn't know that and she needs to know that. So being proactive and demonstrating this interest with your communication is absolutely crucial. The other part that Matt touched on is kind of, again, Matt's in sales, I'm in marketing. So the, the channeling exercise of marketing yourself as a student athlete, crafting an Instagram or a Twitter account that demonstrates and, and brands, for, for lack of a better word, brands you as a student athlete um, can help you engage with coaches social, on social media, with their programs on social media. So having it be more than just email, having it be that phone call once you get some back and forth, having it be that text message, having it be an engagement on social media, hitting them on all these different platforms in an effective way and building out a plan to do that uh, is, a, is a really good way to stand out because coaches inboxes, Matt said, are, they can be crowded. You know, email inboxes are, are crowded in this day and age. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, parents on this call, I feel it. I'm sure that you guys do too. Um, so reaching them in less crowded channels is also a really key piece to helping yourself stand out in addition to being proactive and personalizing every touch point that you have. I will say one, um, 
administrative note on time. I know that we are over the one o'clock hour. Um, I forgot to tee this up at the beginning. I expected that we would go over the hour that we originally budgeted. If you have to go, you have other obligations, feel free to, to step out. We're doing another round of this webinar at 8 p.m. this evening if you would like to attend that one, if you have more free time then, um, 8 p.m. Eastern. Or we also are recording this and we will be sending these out as well. So if you have to leave, um, feel free and you, this will certainly not be the only chance that you have to, uh, to listen to this content. Next up is online profile and video, which is another thing that student athletes can be focused on right now. Now, online profiles can help student athletes gain efficiency in your communication with coaches because instead of sending that email to, you know, Coach Teague at Columbia and Coach Wood at, at Harvard and having to find the these eight attachments and the links to these three YouTube videos and X, Y, and Z else that you need to send to them, you can house it all in one place. So instead of saying, here's these four attachments and these three links, you say, here's this link. Um, and it has the up-to-date transcript. It has the up-to-date SAT scores, contact information, video, all that living on one profile can give you really good efficiency in two ways. One, you're not searching for all those different PDFs to attach and send to a coach every time you send an email. And two, you only have to update things in one place, right? You update things in one place, you know that your profile is up to date with the right video, with the right test scores, the right transcript, because you only have to update it once, and that's where every coach is is going to. We work with a, um, a company called Sports Recruits, which offers free online profiles. They also have some that are kind of paid subscriptions that have increased functionality, but you can register for a Sports Recruits profile for free, and what that does is it gives you this landing page. It gives you a place where you can upload and, and what's really unique about their platform is you can edit video directly in it as well. So it, it makes it really easy to have all your stuff live in one place and be, have that be your recruiting hub for, for coaches in your uh, communication with them. The other thing right now, as I mentioned, that coaches have an, a, an unprecedented amount of time in front of their computers. And one of the things that they are doing and I know this because we've talked with our friends over at Sports Recruits, and they're seeing this traffic on their site from college coaches. Coaches are looking at these profiles, and they are watching video of these players. So getting video up on your profile is a really important piece so that coaches can see more than just a set of numbers. They can actually get a sense, an early sense of how you play and what you look like on the field and how you carry yourself and what your mechanics look like. Coaches want to watch video? Yes. They're absolutely going to have to see you play live. They want to engage with you and meet you face to face and have a conversation and, you know, see you in, in, in live action, but they can start to get a sense of if you might be the right type of player for them on video. So even if it is video, I know that it was probably hard for, um, for student athletes to get a whole lot of game film or even a showcase video from, from right now. Cause it's, you know, that's probably not in the cards for most families, but even if it's video from early this spring, from an early, early season game, or from a winter training session, or from last fall or summer, put that on your profile, include it with a date so that coaches know, oh, this is, this is Samantha playing last August, you know, not a week ago. Um, giving them a sense of that date is also important, but it's really important to have video up on your, your profile. The other thing is, I think that there's a perception that the barrier to entry or the obstacles to creating your own video are bigger than they are. There's a lot of video that you can create and, and get really effectively just with a steady hand, uh, you know, somebody who's willing to film you and, and an iPhone or a smartphone. Um, you can get reps of yourself taking front toss or soft toss or off a tee. You can get video of yourself pitching, um, even if it's on a, a shortened um, a shortened distance so that you can show coaches some of your mechanics. So it doesn't need to be the three camera angles and the professional video production quality and you know all this stuff to be an effective video to give coaches a sense of who you are as a player. It can be done pretty simply and pretty cheaply um, and still give coaches a sense of some of the things that they need to see uh, to be able to get a decent, more decent uh, and more complete look at, at you as a player. Next up is summer recruiting planning and flexibility. Um, so I, I, I'm assuming, I, I think that it's safe to say that the summer that the picture perfect summer that you guys planned out, spring and summer that you guys planned out as a family, as a travel organization in 
November, December, January, whenever it was, it's not going to be, that is not going to be the picture of what your summer looks like this summer with everything going on. It is going to look different. And so a couple of areas of focus this summer in particular that we would encourage families to think about are, are these you see on the screen. One is it's always important to be efficient in targeting the right schools for you and not just going to a tournament because there's a lot of schools. It's getting in front of the right schools and, and not only the right schools, but the right lookalike schools, the schools you know about that could be the right fit and the programs that you might never have heard of, but it turns out might be the right fit. So more, now more than ever, it's really important to be efficient in targeting a high volume of these types of right schools for you, um, which means that, you know, there's going to be some prioritization that you're going to have to make. Am I going to go to X tournament that has 10 coaches and none of them are, the right, are right for me or has 200 coaches and five of them are right for me? Or am I going to go to this showcase or this workout that has, you know, 50 coaches and 25 of them all might be the right fit for me, kind of prioritizing and making some hard choices over the course of the summer so that you're able to intentionally gain efficiency in your recruiting process is going to be really important because what we expect to see, quite honestly, is a, a shortened recruiting cycle this summer. Um, how, and, and being efficient within that window is going to be really important. The, the second thing here is data, analytics, and video. We talked a bit about the importance of video. Using this summer to update your video and get some data and analytics on yourself is going to be really important as well. Um, one reason for this is in a shortened and truncated recruiting cycle, coaches still need to make recruiting decisions at the same end time, which is, you know, the, the September 1st deadline when they're talking to rising juniors or for rising seniors, it's early decision deadline or whatever it is for their school. They're working towards, this, they're working backwards from the same endpoint, but they're going to have less time leading into it. So they need to be able to more quickly get a as complete a view of you as a player as they have from seeing you four or five, six times at different tournaments and showcases. They need to get that same level and, and depth of knowledge of you as a player and as a student athlete, but in a shorter window. Data and analytics and video can help them do that because they're going to watch you play so they get that sense of you. Then they also can put some numbers to you and say, okay, what I saw with my eyes translates to X on the batted ball velocity or Y on the pitch velocity. Um, and having that can give them more comfort in making confident recruiting decisions more quickly uh, in, in a truncated time frame. Video, same thing. You can give them a sense of your development without having to seek them out and find them in you know, June, July, August, and September. If they see you in July and September and they have video from July or August, then they can get a sense of tracking your development over the course of the summer and over the course of that time. Um, Max, mm -hmm. quickly, what, what, what's important is there's going to be decisions that you guys are going to have to make as parents, honestly, um, that there's going to be a lot of things that probably, you know, knock on wood, overlap if we can get out there this summer. There's going to be events, there's going to be tournaments, there's going to be school camps, there's going to be things that people are going to be competing against what's going to be best. I think what people really need to understand is what is going to be best for me, especially for the 2021s and the 2022s that, you know, the time is now and your, your opportunity is, you know, has to be within this window. You need to do what's going to be best for you. And if it is a tournament and that's where you get seen and that's where you, you know, perform at the highest level and, you know, you, you've seen so many other kids get offers and do that, then that may, that's one thing, but also going to a camp or going to a, uh, an event that has yielded really, really good results, that may have to be something that you have that conversation with your travel team or program with and say, right now I got to look after me. I have to in this day and age. And so that's what we're seeing is on the efficiency side, making the right decisions that may not always be the team decision, but it may have to be a me decision. And and this, it, it's a great point, Matt, and this comes to the third bullet point, which is being proactive. I think that in a typical summer travel ball season, you would naturally and organically come about a handful of recruiting exposure opportunities that, that could offer some of what we're talking about. This summer with a most likely shortened recruiting cycle um, and in a summer that looks different and more truncated summer than we're used to, you have to be more intentional in seeking out the right opportunities for you. Um, and, and when we think about our camps, that is what we're focused on. We're focused on really, especially on these first two bullet points of 
creating a, a critical mass and a high volume, but also great efficiency in terms of create, uh, really bringing together a lot of high academic schools and schools that could be the right fit and also giving them not just, okay, I'm going to watch these 150, 140 girls play over the course of the next two days, but we're going to give them data analytics and video on the student athletes there so that they are comfortable making some of these decisions. So seeking out this type of opportunity, always important, but with more restrictions on the calendar, most likely, it's going to be more important uh, for families to double to double down on in 2020, even than, than, than prior years. The last bullet here is school-specific camps, and specifically, we're talking about school-specific camps in the fall for follow-up exposure. I think that it's important to cast a broad net as you enter the summer, again, targeting efficiently, but a high volume of potentially fit schools. Then as you expand that network of schools from the 20 you did research on to 35, because you meet some new coaches who you really like, then you start to work it back down. And that 35, after you do a bit more research and meet the coaching staff and you know you winnow that down, you say, all right, here's five to 10 schools that I'm still considering that I think could be the right fit for me. Using these school-specific camps to get on campus, meet some of the players in the program, meet the whole coaching staff if you haven't elsewhere, um, and also get follow-up exposure to these coaches um, is can be really important in your recruiting process to deliver results at your target schools once you've uh, narrowed that list down so that it's cost-effective and, and not completely mind-bending to go to 20 or 25 different uh, fall camps, but really focus on the three to five that are the perfect fit for you. Um, Follow-up exposure is something that we talk about a lot and repeat exposure in the recruiting process because um, it is really important for coaches not just to see who you are as a player during this one slice in time, but who the player you, who, what's the player that you are now and then who are you becoming as a player? So demonstrating that development and that growth is also really important because ultimately what they're looking at is not just who's this softball player that I'm recruiting right now when she's 16 or 17 years old, but who is she at 19, 20 years old when she's in my program? So giving them not just one slice, but one slice here and then a slice later to show the strides you've made between those gives them a way to then project out that trajectory and say, here's where I think this player is headed. Max, one one other thing, and I know we're, we're already uh, way over, but this is a lot this is like you know to, to comprehend and so i think in terms of how this is going to look we obviously don't know how the summer is going to look yet i think you know there's a lot of people that are still you know we're all still waiting each week hopefully we, we learn a little bit more of what we're able to do however we have a lot of experience with it with or without this to be able to help guide what is going to be the best avenue for you in the summertime in terms of events and what we've seen and talking to having thousands and thousands of conversations with coaches so feel free and we'll have our, our contact info to call us whether it be myself jenna you um you know will answering these questions we can help say hey this is what we've seen this formula of doing this event that event this thing you know over the course of the summer and fall it you know can be really helpful we're not a recruiting service but we certainly love to help our, our student athletes guide through what could be you know worth their money not worth their money worth their time etc Absolutely. A recruiting resource we're, we're more than happy to be, um, which does bring us to the next point, which is additional resources that we kind of want to touch on pretty briefly before we head into the Q&A. First up, as Matt mentioned, we love being a resource for student athletes and for families. So feel free to check out our blog and social media feeds. Um, we've always been focused on delivering this type of content, but it's been even more so over the last few months. You know, what does this mean for recruiting? How are we helping students and student athletes rather through the recruiting process? So take a look at our Twitter, take a look at our Instagram, check out our blog. We've been posting some videos and articles um, about how student athletes can navigate their recruiting process, specifically in the, you know, spring sport and softball space. Um, on kind of NCAA developments, one key Twitter account that I would put you guys in touch with is D1 Softball. Um, they're the ones who are really tracking a lot of the development at the Division I council level. So the decisions about eligibility and the waivers for scholarships and what this means for Division I and Power Five programs, this is a really good resource to, to follow along with. Um, they have some of these really, uh, really good relationships with elite softball programs, you know, with 
the Oklahomas of the world. Um, they're the ones with the Michigans of the world. They're the ones getting texts from Carol Hutchins saying, oh, you know, here, here's what the Division I Council is, is thinking and saying. So it gives kind of an inside peek as these things develop to stay on top of them. Really important piece, the best resource on your specific programs is going to be your specific programs. Because as we've talked about over the course of this, the developments at the NCAA level or at the Division One level, Division Three level, they're going to be interpreted and handled differently by different coaches and different programs at different schools. So getting in touch with your target programs on social media, filling out their recruiting questionnaire on their website, you know, following along with the developments at your target programs is also going to be really important. One thing that I would advise um, as well is, you know, if you're interested in Amherst, don't just follow Amherst Softball on Instagram and Twitter. Follow the Amher Amherst College, follow a couple other sports, follow Amherst lacrosse or soccer and kind of see what the conversations that they're having are uh, at their school on some of their public channels. A really good resource on standardized testing and admissions, as we touched on, is our friends over at Compass Test Prep. Um, the founder of Compass is an honor roll parent whose uh, son is going on to play baseball at, at Rochester next year, which is a great outcome for him, really excited. Um, and they're delivering some great resources to families right now about what is changing in the standardized testing and admission space. Um, right there, you see that's a link to essentially what their blog is. They have an ongoing post they're updating very frequently with all the new developments. You know, June SATs were just canceled yesterday. Yesterday, the College Board had, uh, released something about uh, digital SAT possibly or, or take home SAT. They're the ones who are kind of covering the evolving uh, landscape there. And so I would say take a look at that. The other thing, as I mentioned earlier, is they did a webinar last Monday, a week and a half ago, where they talked with some college counselors, talked with some college admissions officers about what this means. And that was, it was a long conversation, but it was a really good one to give some insight into how, um, especially how college admissions offices are thinking about current events and current developments and what they mean for their admission cycles. And then softball and drill work. As I mentioned, I don't think that you know, high school softball players need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to continuing to get better during this time. There's a host of different uh, social media content and resources and websites that are out there to help you get better. Key ones, of course, as we mentioned, being your travel coach and, and your instructors in your network. Another one that I would say is if you're if you're looking for some ideas on drill work, take a look at the NFCA. They have some interviews with coaches. They do a periodic podcast where they can talk through some of this. They do some coach specific content where they say, here's some drills you can do with your girls. Feel free to use those uh, to help you develop your game as well. And another Instagram account that I that I love following is the Package Deal. They're doing some stuff that is also monetized. They're doing um, online kind of coaching sessions as well. Um, but also, if you just follow their social media accounts, you can get a sense of what they're doing. Um, certainly no obligation on, on our end all to, to sign up for anything that does cost money with them, but they're a good resource for giving you ideas for, uh, you know, restricted space drills that you can do as well. Now we're going to transition into the live Q&A. Um, and while we do that, so a quick reminder to, to get your question asked so that we can make sure we address it. Um, there should be a questions tab in the GoToWebinar toolbar. Type right in there, send to it. Uh, send over to, to Kevin. He's collecting them, answering some via chat. He's also collecting them, and we're going to answer as many questions as possible right now. If you have a personal follow-up question, or we don't get to what um, to one thing that you have in mind, or it doesn't occur to you until tomorrow, we are certainly more than happy to continue to be a resource. So I'm going to flip back to this additional resources page, and you see there I've added our contact information. If anything comes up, feel free to send us an email, give us a call. We're all working remotely, but we're standing by to make sure we get questions answered. The other thing is on our website, if you go to headfirsthonorl.com, that we have a live chat function where you will be chatting with me, Will, or Matt, um, and say, hey, I heard about this in the webinar, I had a quick follow-up question. Um, we love being a resource for families, and we would love to continue to be. So if you have a question now, fire it away. If you have a question in a week, also still fire it away, just in a, a slightly different channel. So with that, um, Kevin, I'd love to turn it over to the to the Q and A. What do we What do we have? Thank you, Max. Uh, a couple questions queued up here. First one I'll start with. Um, we've had some conversations with college coaches, and I know that we we like to keep those conversations private and confidential. Um, but are there any themes or any takeaways from those conversations that we can share with everyone? Um, 
broadly speaking, I mean, I think that they are, you know, the, the main takeaway, the main takeaways that I would point to are, are two things. One, as we touched on, everybody is in the same, the same boat on this, right? Uh, it's not like there are certain colleges that are out there playing and recruiting right now and others that aren't. So everybody's in the same boat. Everybody is dealing with the same restrictions from a recruiting standpoint, from a playing standpoint. So it's important to keep that in mind. Doing the best that you can with what you have is what everybody is doing. But the other thing is, there is going. This is going to open back up, and coaches are still going to need to recruit. You know, a, a main thing that I've heard from coaches is, whenever it is that this opens up, guess what? I still have to go recruit 2021s. I still have to go talk to 2022. So when it opens back up, there is going to be the same appetite for recruiting because in 2021 and in 2022. Harvard and Amherst and Columbia and Yale, they're still going to have softball teams, um, especially at schools like that. They're still going to have this recruiting need. So being ready when this does open up is the way to set the table for yourself for that. But understanding that coaches are all in the same boat, they're you know a little stir crazy and they're looking for things to do and, and fill their time. And they are thinking about their next steps in recruiting just as you are. Great, thanks, Max. Um, two similar questions here. We're gonna go in numerical order. Where does Division II fit into all this? Have there been some rule changes there as well? Scholarship availability, all this. Yeah, so uh, great question. Um, Division II does also offer uh, does also offer scholarships. It's not the same level. I believe it's eight instead of twelve. I, I don't I don't recall offhand. We um, quite honestly we work with fewer Division II schools just because for whatever reason more schools in the high academic space tend to congregate at the Division One and Division Three levels. Um, they do offer scholarships. They are for the most part acting um, kind of in lockstep with Division One. They have also extended their recruiting dead period through to May 31st. They also have extended another year of eligibility. They also have allowed a, a one-year waiver for the 2021 season. So um, for specifics, again, look at the, if, if you're looking at a specific Division II school, take a look at their program, take a look at the Division II website. They are mostly, um, from everything that I've read and understood and, and digested, they're following the same principles of, of action as um, the, as Division One and Division Three schools as well. Great. And then with Division Three, can you talk a little bit about the recruitment calendar there, the differences in scholarships? Um, sure. So first, scholarships, unfortunately, at the Division Three level do not exist for athletic aid. That is a Division Three wide decision. Um, so no athletic scholarships. The merit scholarship versus financial aid picture is different depending on the school as it is at all different levels. Um, for example, NESCAC schools, Division Three, do not offer merit scholarships, or a, a lot of them do not offer merit scholarships in that same way, and they are purely need-based aid. Whereas other schools, Grinnell or MIT, whatever, do have some merit scholarship money available. Um, none of them have athletic money. Some do have merit for academics. Um, the timeline for Division Three is a little bit later than some of the Division I schools that we work with. But what I think is really important to keep in mind is that at all high academic schools, it's different than at a Harvard or BU than it is at an Oklahoma or an Ole Miss, right? The softball team is more in line academically, kind of writ large, with the general population in terms of being that uh, academic profile. So what that means is that oftentimes these things happen a little bit later at high academic schools and especially in division three schools, they need to have a, a recruiting college coach needs to have two and a half or even three years of a high school transcript and some kind of test, uh, standardized test um, score to be able to walk that file over to admissions and say, here's a, here's a player I would like to like to commit. If you're Lacey Wood at Harvard and you say, here's a girl I'd like to admit, and you walk over with, you know, ninth grade scores and a and an eight, seventh grade PSAT score, that's not gonna really move the admissions office in, in Harvard Yard in the same way that walking over with here's two and a half or three years of a high school transcript and here's their ACT score. Um, so keeping in mind that this does tend to move a little bit later, especially at the division three level, we see a lot of action in recruiting between June and October, October, November of uh, for rising seniors. So if you're a 2021, this summer at Division Three schools is going to be a really key piece to see results in your recruiting process. Now, a key piece of that is that does not mean that you say, okay, I'm going to wait until after my junior year 
to start this process or to get this first exposure. Laying the groundwork with exposure to these programs before that is also a really good way to get on their radar and to stay in touch with these programs. Matt, anything to add there in terms of that early exposure and, and kind of making strides in the recruiting? Yeah, so I think, you know, we look at what happened, you know, two months ago versus what ha what's happening now. And I don't think much has changed. And if anything, getting out earlier may be a little bit more important because we just don't know what our limitations are going to be. So being able to get you know, good video metrics and things like that in front of a college coach and into their hands while they can see you is really important while you can. So you do have a uh, kind of line in the sand here, and then you're going to continue to move on and show, here's how I've improved. We know this kid, and it's a plug and play. So I think a lot of people are like, oh, high academic school is great. We will go to a camp, or we will go to, you know, a school-specific camp or see that coach right before my senior year. Well, a lot of other people have been doing this since their sophomore year, their junior year, and these coaches know who these kids are. So it really is about the development. I think even, you know, also, yes, they're not committing early on like they would at a big Power 5 school, but it's important for these coaches to also get to know who the kids are because they want to know, is this kid going to be a right fit for not just the team, but for the school? And they have a really nice pulse on that because they have that um, that relationship with the admissions office. So being able to go out early, making sure that you're really, really efficient and when you go and what you're doing while you're there, as well as the communication piece, those really tie in together uh, to kind of, you know, make sure that it's important to, uh, to see the, you know, the future of where you want to go to school. Great. Thank you guys. Um, we talked a little bit about digital, digital recruiting. Um, can you talk about how social media plays into that, how you can use it to your advantage? And if you are not social media savvy, are you at a disadvantage? Great question. I know we talked about this on a webinar we did last night for um, at, at some length. Um, first of all, I don't think you're at a disadvantage if you don't. Um, student athletes have a lot going on in their lives. They have the classroom, they have the testing, they have the softball, they have jobs or family obligations, they have friends. All those are more important than, than the social media. The, the best thing that you can do to advance your recruiting is to get the best grades you possibly can, max out your standardized test scores, and get better at softball. If you have a proclivity or if you have an inclination to, um, to take on the social media aspect of it, then the things that I think are important are curating a social media feed to create an effective brand for yourself as a student athlete, where it demonstrates what you care about and it demonstrates your commitment to the things that matter to you. So demonstrating the effort you put in on the softball field or in the weight room or in the classroom, like all those things can help give coaches a good sense of who you are as a, as a player and as a, as a person. If you have a social media presence, coaches are going to look for it. They're going to find your Instagram account. They're going to find your Twitter account and they're going to look at it to make sure that it is on brand with who they're recruiting and who they want in their program. So if you have it, make sure that it is appropriate and curated and communicates effectively who you are as a student athlete. If you do not have it, you certainly do not need to create one. It can be additive. It can be helpful because it allows coaches to get a decent, uh, a different kind of look at you. And also it allows for some back and forth. You can use that account to go on and, you know, comment on their posts or like their posts or give them that follow or whatever it is. So it can be another way to engage with coaches as well as being a way for them to get a sense of who you are. Max, to that point though, one, one quick plug is, just to reiterate, it can hurt you though. So you want to make sure because, you know, that's public for any coach and any admissions office to be able to see. And you just want to make sure we read in the news, uh, you know, athletes and, and actors and everything else that, you know, it can come back to hurt them, especially for the higher academic schools. You're looking at, you know, quality of kid. And I think that's important to make sure that, you know, these student athletes do have one and maybe it's not just dedicated to sports, but it is appropriate for anybody and that would be anybody um, to be able to view. So 
that's one thing. And then to the email point, we talked about this maybe in, in, in the webinar uh, webinar yesterday or, or last week, uh, is you know being able to create an email, you know whether that's Matt Sternberg, uh, you know six one seven at Gmail, you know, or Matt Sternberg twenty twenty two at Gmail. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be related to to softball or or any sport, but you know having something that's like that that's coming from the student athlete and not from you know, sterny mom or whatever it is that my mom has is really, really important that it's coming from the student athlete, it's coming back in from them, and it's a way to be able to communicate, um, if, especially if you don't have that social media feed. I completely agree. And I think that having a dedicated email account for um, the recruiting process can be really helpful in, in other ways as well. Um, a, you know, it, it shouldn't be Red Sox rocks at yahoo.com or at msn.com, whatever it is. Create one that has your name in it, maybe has your grad year, something like that, so that it's it's very clear what this is and it it is portraying kind of a, a maturity, right? Um, the other thing is this can be an inbox that parents and advisors and coaches even maybe have access to because as much as adults in 2020 are used to staying on top of email inboxes, high schoolers might not be. And so having another set of eyes to make sure that no communication falls through the cracks can be a really good way um, to help out your student athlete as well. And to be that support network is, hey, I saw that you got an email from Coach Johnson at Amherst. Have you replied? Or I saw that you haven't replied. Can you? Do you want to? Um, and kind of being that that kind of push and, and another set of eyes to make sure that nothing you know escapes the radar. Matt, I thought Sterny Mom was your email address this whole time, so I'm glad we cleared that up. Uh, um, yeah, well, you make sure you're sending it to me and not her. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the next question we have here, this is one we get every recruitment period, but I think it is uh, particularly interesting right now, given the potential impact on events this summer. For players who are considering walking on, when is that the right move for them, and what sort of factors factors do they need to consider when passing up a guaranteed offer to try and walk on at the school? Sorry, could you could you repeat that? Absolutely. So, um, question about walking on at a program. Um, when is that the right move, and what sort of factors would you need to consider when thinking about passing up a guaranteed offer to try and walk on at a different program? Great question. So, I think that the the signing day the photo op the early commitment the early decision the being done with this process early um that's what like everybody is chasing in this but it's not the only finish line in the recruiting process there are every year there are software players who commit early decision or commit early decision two or commit regular decision or even after regular decision and also walk on or some some sort of recruited walk on so within the walk on space there are different Ask, like there are different types of, of walk-ons as well. Technically at Amherst, I was a walk-on. They have slotted um, spots for each sport. That they That's kind of the golden ticket where they say, hey, Matt Sternberg, you are in to Amherst as a baseball player, apply early or whatever, and, and you're good to go. And then there's people like me who went through the process and the coach said, you have the grades and scores to get in on your own. I'm going to put a handwritten letter in your file saying, please let Max in. He's a good enough student and I think he can contribute to the baseball team. That is a what's called a recruited walk-on. There's also a pure walk-on where coach might not know that you even applied to the school and you communicate with them after and say, hey, can I have a fall tryout? The things to consider on that, I think that it can be a really good option to make sure that you are attending the college that is the right fit with or without softball. It's really important that if you're going to walk on somewhere, you make sure that without softball, you are still going to be happy at that school because a walk-on's chances, depending on the program, are not nearly as high as at having a roster spot. Um, the other thing is communication with the coach is really important. I think that it would be very, very difficult at almost any program to show up on September 1st and say, hey, coach, I'm in. You've never talked to me. You've never seen me play. I'd love to try out for the team. Um, but if it's a coach that you've seen or has seen you play and you've communicated with, you say, hey, coach, I know I don't have, um, like, I'm, I'm not one of your slots. You're not getting me in. You're not giving me that golden ticket. Okay, next step. Can you support my application and admissions? You know, Max, we like you, but I think you're a great person. But I don't necessarily think that I'm going to be able to put that letter in your file either. Great. Coach, if I get in on my own, 
will you give me a fall tryout or an early spring tryout to compete for a roster spot? I think I can contribute to your program. Will you give me that opportunity? The answer to any of these questions could be yes or no. You might get the golden ticket. You might get the recruited walk-on slot. Um, you might get the opportunity to try out. The really key piece is to communicate with the coach at the program that you're walking onto, just to know what you are walking into. Um, if you talk to a coach and you say, hey coach, can I have a fall tryout? And they say, yes, you can have a week long tryout, but I'm gonna be honest, in the 10 years I've been here, we've only had one walk on. That's a different picture that you could be walking into as opposed to a different program where they say, yeah, we have at least two or three girls on the team every year who are who are pure walk-ons, um, which the, the, uh, at the Division three level is more common than at the Division one level, certainly, as well. Awesome. Coming up on our last few questions here, um, first one I have is, does one position have a better chance of being recruited as compared to another one? And how can players find out which positions coaches are looking for? Great question. Um, I mean, the short answer is coaches need to recruit a whole team, right? They need every position. So there's not one position that has an advantage over others. I don't, I don't think, um, at least not kind of fixed year by year. There might be, because if you look at, and this is where kind of what can you do to, to check what a school might be looking for, take a look at their roster. If they have four outfielders on their roster and three of them are seniors. And you know that the next year they're going to need, they're going to need some, some outfielders, right? They need somebody coming in to literally cover ground in the outfield. Um, or if you're a catcher and you're looking and you say, all right, well, they have a senior co-captain who's a catcher. They have a sophomore who's a catcher and they have two freshmen who just came on who are catchers. Maybe they're full at catcher, but it does differ from year to year. Um, and just depends on a team needs. There might be, there are years when the same player could end up with a scholarship at a program and in a different year, they might not get any money. They might not even get let onto that program, just depending on what the positional needs are of. When we talk about recruiting, we talk about playability as opposed to recruitability. So just because you can play at a level of college softball doesn't necessarily mean that you are recruitable because it depends on the needs of any specific program. Um, Bucknell might be Bucknell and, and Lafayette compete every year. They play in the Patriot League. They play a pretty similar level of softball. There might be a given year when you are recruitable at one of them, but not at the other, just based on the positional needs um, of that program. So the things you can do to, to kind of take advantage of this or to get a sense of this is do roster research and look at the rosters, look at what the positions they have that are filled and what very critically, what the grad years are of the position you, you play. Um, I will say that coaches, while they need to fill every position, they aren't necessarily recruiting a specific position. They're not saying, I need a right fielder, therefore I'm only going to watch right fielders. They're thinking, I need the best 15 or 18 players in my program, and the best nine are going to play. It, there's a lot of kids. I was a high school shortstop, but guess what? I didn't play an inning of college shortstop. Um, you, the coaches are recruiting athletes who can compete and contribute at the plate and in the field. So if you look at college rosters, there's probably a lot of pure outfielders who are playing the outfield. There's also probably, depending on the program, a lot of middle infielders who have been converted to outfield based on the needs of the team. So keeping in mind the flexibility that you are able to have as a player and how can you develop the skills that translate to your position and to the game as a whole so that you can demonstrate um, some manner of, of you know versatility where you're like, yeah, I'm primarily a shortstop, but also I've learned enough about outfield footwork that I can pick that up or I can hit it hard enough that it's not going to matter my, my outfield footwork. You're going to find a place for me in the field, whether that's at shortstop or first base or center field, whatever the case may be. Great. And, and last question here that we'll wrap up with. Um, I know there's not one, one exact blueprint for coach communication, but let's say you've sent that introductory email, given the coach some information on you. What's your next step? What's that second communication look like? Is it also an email? What kind of information should you look to include? Uh, any any preferences or tips from you guys there? Matt, you want to take it? Sorry, that just broke up for me. Did yeah, guys through? Gotcha. So the the second point of contact with coaches, it it's going to depend. I think that. The key thing, as Matt touched on earlier, is having a reason to contact them, whether that is a phone call or an email or 
a note through a recruiting platform, whatever, whatever it is. And it's going to, it's going to depend on the coach's preference. A lot of coaches, especially now, you know, as the world gets older, coaches get younger. Um, and so they are moving to text instead of phone calls or, you know, text instead of email or email instead of phone calls. Every coaching staff's preference is going to be a little bit different. I think that email for the first one or two touch points is completely okay. Mixing in a handwritten letter, mixing in a phone call, and then getting a sense of what the coach wants you to do. Hey, coach, I'd love to, you know, we've had a back and forth. I'd love to talk to you next week because I have my next round of standardized testing coming back then, whatever. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to email it to you? Do you want me to call you, text you? And you can get that preference directly from them because it's going to vary um, coach by coach and program by program, just how they handle their recruiting and their communications. And Max, uh, to that point, I, I also think you can be direct with a college coach. I don't think you want to be rude. You need to make sure that there's that line there, right? But, you know, being able to ask a college coach, you know, are you still actively recruiting this grad year? Are you still recruiting outfielders for this grad year. I think those are some ways to get some sort of response and reaction. But mixing up that channel, as I had said earlier, I think is key. But you guys have, you know, I think being patient right now and, and it is also something that, you know, you have to understand from these coaches. Another thing is not, it's not a comfortable thing for me to say is sometimes you're emailing a coach and a coach has never heard of you and you have not played in front of them and you're not necessarily at that level and you just don't know and they may not be interested a coach isn't always going to say thank you but we're not interested actually very rarely is a coach going to say that so i think it's also reading the writing on the wall as best as you can and that is not to say you send one email and you don't get a response, oh, I'm not interested in that school. But being able to put yourself on a timeline to say, okay, I emailed this coach. I saw them at this event. They didn't really respond. I, I then followed up with an email with my video and I'm just not getting that response. Maybe it's not right. Um, and so I think there's that line of being able to really do that because I think there's a lot of coaches, this coach isn't getting back to me. Like what's going on? I think there is some of that where it just may not be the right fit. That's okay. There's thousands of other coaches that are out there for you to be able to go and connect with. Yeah, and I think that that's a, a really key point that we talk about a lot at camp is both expressing and also kind of receiving and validating genuine interest from, from programs. Um, personal notes from coaches are a demonstration of legitimate interest, but lacking that you sometimes i think student athletes and families are left trying to you know read the tea leaves and think well i got this email from a coach does that mean that they like me does that mean that i'm one of the recruits are they recruiting me are they not rather than once you have laid a communication foundation as matt mentioned it's important to be direct and, and be pretty straightforward especially as you move later on down um, the decision tree where you are you need to start making decisions and having unknown variables from college coaches can be an obstacle to you doing that. So the way that I refer to it is Schrodinger's recruit, right? Schrodinger's cat is in the box is both alive and dead until you open the box and find out. You need to open the box in your recruiting process by asking a coach, coach, we've had a lot of back and forth. You've seen me play a couple times. I would like to know where do you see me falling in your recruiting class for 2022s or 2021s, or are you recruiting me? You know, where, where do I fall? Where do I stand with you? Um, and what's really tough about that is that sometimes the answer to that question is going to be, no, we are not recruiting you. We do not think that you are the right fit for our program. That's always going to hurt. It's, it's never fun hearing that no, but equipped with that answer, whether it's a yes or a no, you can now take the next step in your recruiting, which is ultimately what's important. Without, without that answer, with all those unknowns, as you move toward decisions, you can't make those decisions until you have some of those things locked in. So the obstacle is the way. Every no down the path also takes you further down the path of finding the right fit, even if it's not at the school that you originally dreamed of because you heard a no from them. So shake off that no learn from the no about level setting academically or athletically where you might fit. If you get a no from UCLA, it doesn't mean you can't play college softball. It just might mean you can't play at UCLA. So chase the next one down and use every no to get more feedback on where you fall in this recruiting process and solicit that information directly when you can and when you are comfortable doing it, understanding that you're never going to be fully comfortable doing it because the answer to that question can and will 
hurt during this process. You will hear no's during this process. Learning from them is what's really, really important. Well said. Awesome. I think that's a great place to, to stop the live Q&A. Uh, if anyone does still have questions, feel free to send them to the chat still. I'll stay on for a little bit and answer them. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, we have our contact information up on the screen. Feel free to reach out there as well. Thank you all for, for taking this time. I know we ran over. I, I appreciate everybody who, who stuck with us. We'll be posting this recording on YouTube and on our blog in the next few days, as well as emailing it out. So stay tuned for that. Thank you all for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Feel free to reach out if there's any answers that we can give you as you move through this process um, and, and try to navigate your spring and summer of recruiting. Thanks, guys. Take care.